On today's podcast, we are going to talk to somebody who I think is a very unique individual. I've had a chance to talk to him a few times now, uh, met him uh, virtually at the Cool Clinic, uh, had talked to him actually before in the summer, and I think just a unique guy with uh, incredible perspective on this game, a love for the game that is just going to come through in this interview, and that's the special teams coordinator for the Hamilton Tiger Cats, Jeff Reinbold. Coach, great to have you here today. Thank you, my brother. So, Coach, we're going to get right into it and uh, just want to hear about your start in coaching. I know you have some great stories, some things you've learned along the way, uh, but I would like you to share that with our listeners here. You know, that's an interesting, really interesting question. But I think the thing that's probably uh, the most unique and, and the thing that probably shaped me more than anything else was the amount of really great people that I've been able to be around coming through this thing because I you know as a, as a I was not a particularly well adjusted you know high school high school kid and or college kid and you know you you're a player and you're playing in college football and you think you know it's just going to go on forever and I remember Jack Bicknell who was my college coach called me in the office one day I was walking past him walking past his office to go to the locker room and and uh, he says Jeffrey get in here and like there was only two people ever called me Jeffrey. That was my mother. And that was Jack when he was mad at me and my mom. When he, so I thought, you know, you go in there and you get, go through that mental Rolodex and you start thinking, well, okay, what did I do wrong? <laughs> I, I, skipped, I didn't skip class this week. I didn't do it. And he, he looked across the desk at me. And this is like, I had six games left in my senior year. He looked across the desk at me and he goes, what are you going to do when this is over? And I was like, huh? Over. You know, like you think you're going to play. I mean, everybody, whether you're an NFL player or you're a college player, you think it goes on forever. Well, it doesn't go on forever. And he said to me at that time, he said, Jeff, I think I think you should you should think about coaching. And, I, and, you know, my dad was in professional baseball for 30 years and was the winningest high school baseball coach in the state of Indiana, all this kind of stuff. But I had never even considered going into coaching. And, and uh, so I called my dad that night and and uh, I said, Dad, you know, I think I want to coach. And Keith, he told me every reason not to. There's no money in it. There's no security in it. It's hard on families. It's, you know, da, da, da. he went through the whole thing. What he was doing was, you know, his, his deal was, you know, you, you can't, you, you got to be all in. You can't be a ham and, it, it, to use his terminology, you can't be a ham and eager, you know. If you're going to be in it, be in it. And uh, that was great advice. And then what Jack did was he had just left to take the Boston, he was just leaving to take the Boston College job. And he said, I'll take you with me as a GA to Boston College, but I don't think that's the right thing for you because what you need to do is get out in the business and make your own set of contacts. You'll always have us, you'll always have the guys, you know, like for the University of Maine, you had Paul Boudreau who coached for years and years and years in the National Football League. Jerry DiNardo, who was the head coach at Vanderbilt and LSU and Indiana. I mean, you had guys, I mean, it was amazing. Uh, Kevin Lempa coached for the Chargers and, and was defensive coordinator at Boston College. Number, I mean, we had a staff of really, really great coaches at the University of Maine and they were all leaving to go to Boston College. And so Jack sends me uh, the blue book of college athletics. And I'm sure you can remember that thing, right? It had every school in America that played foot college football. Mm -hmm. And he said, start writing, start writing letters and, you know, get yourself a job. So like I write 75 handwritten <laughs> letters and it got to the point, Keith, where I pick them out of the mailbox and I could tell by, I I'd wave them like this. And I'd know it was like that, that letter that you get that says, Thank you for your interest in the program. We'll keep your resume on file. Da, 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 da. And you know what that was, right? So I'm like, I got like 73 no's. And finally, one comes from New Mexico State. There was a guy named Gil Krieger was there at the time. And Coach Krieger, it was the same letter, but he had written over it. He said, one of my coaches just took the job at Western Montana. He may be looking for assistance. And he wrote the guy's number down, right? He said, use my name. Right? Now, I had never met Gil Krieger and still haven't ever met Gil Krieger. I, I don't even know if he's still alive. But the guy really changed my life because that was the only opportunity I had. I was ready to go to the Peace Corps, swear to God. I was going to go to the Peace Corps because my mom said, you ain't staying at home 
and you're a college graduate, go out and do something with your life. <laughs> so I, if I don't get this job at Western Montana, I'm going to the Peace Corps. And I end up getting the job and, you know, it's just started a chain reaction of things that, and people that really were unique to me. The biggest influence, the absolute biggest, and without a shadow of a doubt, the biggest was Dick Vermeil. Uh -huh. And I met, I met Dick Vermeil when I was an assistant at the University of Pennsylvania. He had had his burnout with the Eagles and he was doing, uh, he was an analyst for, uh, I think CBS and he was doing Cadillac commercials and you know, he was you know, retired. And he came and did a presentation to our staff at the University of Pennsylvania. Now I'm about 27 or eight at that time. And if you've ever met Coach, he's he's one of the most giving people you you could imagine. And he's very intense and very obviously very driven. And so I'm the same kind of pers personality type, right? So I don't know, I don't know. And he comes to do this because, and I mean, I was like a leech on him, and I'm like asking him nine million questions and. You know, the other guys on the staff, they, you know, they're looking at it. They want to go play racquetball at noon and all this other shit. I'm, I'm just, I just keep asking questions, right? So he, the thing, the day's over with, and he comes up to me and he said, you know, he handed me his card and he said, let me know if I can ever help you, right? And, uh, you know, so I thought, whatever. So I take, I, I leave at the end of that year and I take a job at Rocky Mountain College. Now, Keith. We were talking about bad jobs. <laughs> this is the this is the bottom of the food chain. I mean, it is absolutely the worst job in college. Had to be the worst job in college football. Eight hundred students. I go to to for the interview, and they had it was like January, and they hadn't even washed the uniforms from the last game they played in November. So I walk in the locker room. The place stinks, right? But I take the job. <laughs> I take the job. <laughs> And so we say, okay, we're going to have a press conference in Billings, Montana. That means three guys are going to be there, but we're going to have a press conference, right? <laughs> we don't have a ball. They'd stolen all the footballs after the game. When the head coach got fired, they, the kids came in and stole all the footballs. So we go to the press conference. We got to, we got to go to Billings West high school and ask them if we can borrow a football to have a football on the desk at the, at this big press conference. But that, got me back in touch with coach for meal for the second time, because he had said to me, like I, like I said to you, he said, let me know if I can help you. Well, the president called me into his office when he said, he said, we're having a, a fundraiser in the spring. We need a keynote speaker. Can you get me? Is there anybody you can get for us? Right. I said, you know, like being young and dumb, I go, well, I'll get you coach for meal. Right. And the, the president, he's like, Oh, you could do that. I said, yeah, I'll get it done. So I called coach and I knew he loved hunting fish that like those are his passions, right? Especially fishing. And this school is located in Billings, Montana, right on the, right on the Yellowstone river. Call him. And the first time I called him since like 18 months previous, when he did that presentation for us. And I said, coach, uh, how'd you like to come out and speak at this fundraiser? I'll put you on blue ribbon trout water and all this stuff. Right. And I said, I can't pay you. But, you know, would you like to come out and do this for you? But I, and again, so he says, yes, right? And he flies out and he spends three days with us. So I get like total access to the guy. Now, again, Keith, you got to understand, this is the smallest NAI school in America, right? And we got kids from like, you know, like Sydney, Montana and, you know, like, Belfry, the Belfry bats. And yeah, these guys, these kids played six man football, some of them. Right. And so all of a sudden in walks Dick for a meal. And I mean, he, these kids are like, they can't even believe it. Right. So he comes and he actually goes on the field and coaches our kids. And, you know, he, everything coach does, he does 100. I like, he, like when, when this, I, I got a guide to take him trout fishing. And the guy said he wore his ass out because he started casting before they got out of got out on the water and kept casting until the boat was the boat was landed on shore. I mean that's the way he does everything. So he's working with these kids and coaching these kids, and we play the alumni 
in the spring game because we don't have enough players to divide up and play a regular game. So we have we invite the alumni back. Well, shit, the alumni come back and they got a beer keg on the sideline. And I mean, <laughs> it's a circus, but that's all we could. That's all we and then the kids have not won a game in like two years. And so we beat the alumni, the, the drunken alumni we beat. Right. And we go into the locker room afterwards and coach comes in the locker room and the kids give coach the game ball from the, from the spring game. Right. And coach for meal, like being coach for meal. And this is, he's never, he's always genuine. Right. He's got tears running down his face and he tells the kids how much it meant to him to be able to coach again and yada, yada, yada. And like it was the most magical moment. And that's one of the formative things that I had happened to me in my career, because I realized that it's not the level that you're coaching. Right. It's not. I mean, here we are at the bottom. Like there were probably in the state of Montana. There were probably 15 high school jobs that were better than Rocky Mountain College at that time, right? But there's a guy who had taken the Eagles to the Super Bowl, you know, beat Ohio State when he was at UCLA in the Rose Bowl, had, you know, I mean, done all these things. And he's out there coaching up these kids, these class C kids from state, you know, little tiny towns all over Montana, as if he was coaching Howard Carmichael and, you know, Bunting and, you know, Ron Jaworski and all the guys he had and, and coaching our staff. I mean, he, he, like, we got guys, I mean, we're like a typical small college situation. Like nobody really is full-time. They're just, they're full-time in what they give, but they're not full-time in what they get. You know, they're not getting paid hardly anything. And he's in there and he's, he's helping those guys with everything. And, you know, you knew it was just an, a magical experience. And, and that's what it hit me. I said, you know what? it really, it, big time is where you're at, you know, big time is where you're at. And so that was so, so important. And on the way, when I was taking him to the airport, we we're driving and he said, pull over. Now, it, I mean, there's nothing to pull over. I mean, it's like a two lane highway to the airport. He says, pull over. And I pulled over and he said, you know, I got to tell you, I see a lot of, I said, I see a lot of me in you. And, and he said, uh, you gotta be careful. He said, this game will eat you alive. And he told me his story about his, his burnout. And he said, I'm going to send you something. It'll mean, it means, it'll mean way more to you than it means to me now. Right. And I had no idea, Keith, what he's talking about. Right. So he leaves, goes back to Philadelphia. And about 10 days later, the, the person at the, at the mail room at Rocky Mountain College calls me. She said, we have some mail for you, right? And I said, well, can you have somebody walk it down? And she said, I'm sorry, it's too big. I said, what? She said, it's too big. Uh, but if you get a dolly, you can probably take it down there. So I, I grab a dolly and I go down to the, to the mail, which is, you know, there's only like eight buildings on campus is one of the other buildings. And I, and I go in and there's a cardboard box key four feet tall and about, you know, it's one of those big cardboard moving boxes. Mm -hmm. And I have put every single notebook, playbook. I mean, this is stuff going back to when he was an assistant at Stanford, when he was a high school coach in San Jose. I mean, it was, it was like a treasure trove of football stuff. Right. And he was passing it to me, which Again, was one of the things he taught us, right? Or taught anybody that was one of his guys. And I consider myself one of his guys is you got to pay forward what you're given, right? So we have a responsibility to the next one, which is what you're doing, right? That's the beauty of what, what you're doing is you're taking what you've been gifted and you're giving it to the next generation of guys. Right. Because the message to me, the message is timeless. Right. Whether it's the run and shoot, the wishbone, the RPO system, power football, it's all football. That's not the stuff. The stuff is what it means to coach, yeah. to care about the kids, to love the game, to respect the game, all the things, all of those messages. So he gives that and that really, really shaped me. And so to this day, 30, almost, no, almost 40, 
five years from that time, when I go into training camp, before we go to the season, I go back through his coach's manual and it talks about organizing practice. It talks about, you know, communication with players. It talks about staff loyalty. It talks about all the things because when he was in Kansas city, he brought me to training camp and let me work with them for, for uh, you know, the four training camp games. And he would go through this with his staff and then with the team every night. So now it really resonates with me because I saw him stand up and talk to Tony Gonzalez and, you know, uh, Priest Holmes and all these about these very same things. Well, every year I go back and reread that. And then every year we use, we implement those very same concepts. One of the, one of the strongest ones, and I've heard other guys say it now is before you, before you teach, you must reach, right? Players don't care about how much you know until they know about how much you care, right? All of the things that made him a success and made every program that he was ever a part of. And I'm, I mean, you can look it up. Uh, I mean, he, 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 they won everywhere. They won everywhere he was at. And it was because of those foundational principles that he passed on to me, which we try and pass on to the players. Because they're the same things that are, you know, what we, what we learned, you know, when we talked, we were laughing earlier about how the learning has changed now. It's now it's a computer where with us, it used to be a napkin in a, in, you know, at, at, the, at the national convention somewhere. But the things that we learned from the guys that we respected and the guys that we admired, they're, they're, they're timeless. Those, are, those transcend time because they're human principles. And this is a, this is a human game. We're, we're coaching people, not X's and O's, right? Actual humans with feelings and insecurities and egos and all of the things that make this job so freaking incredible. And then I go to pro football because of him. And I get to know people like June Jones and Mouse Davis and Jerry Glanville and all, just hundreds and hundreds of tremendous tremendous coaches and you know you can't you saying man how did a kid from south Bend, indiana how did this ever happen like it's like i mean sometimes i really do wonder it's like what the shit did i do to deserve this right because i was just like just a guy like any other guy right i'm not special i don't i'm not smarter or none of that more talented or none of that i mean i love the game that's you know, that's it. So, you know, I hope that, again, I feel like there's a responsibility that we have, right, as guys with a little gray in our beards, to share that and pass that forward. And, and the next generation, whatever they choose to do schematically, the, the game, you know, the game doesn't, like, for example, this is, again, a vermilism. And, and I don't know if you ever knew Frank Gann, Sr., Frank Ann Sr. Was, was another beautiful, beautiful guy. And I mean, believed 1,000%. If you ever talk to Chris Spielman, ask him about Frank Ann Sr. And really, really was a fundamentalist, a fundamental teacher, a fundamental coach. You know, and I watched how passionate he was about teaching the fundamentals of the game, right? Because that's the game, right? We, we get so caught up in scheme sometimes that we lose the fact that, and I see this and I'll be honest with you, I, this is not a criticism, it's an observation. I see more and more kids come to us in pro football, Keith, that don't know how to deliver a blow. Just simple blow delivery, which should be the thing that they're learning in the most fundamental level of the game. They're not because the coaches are more concerned about winning or you know having a 400 yard passing day or whatever it is than given the player a better tool chest to take beyond him, right? Because to me, like the greatest, if I was a, if, 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 if a player played for me and then went to someplace else, what I would like that other coach to call me and say about that kid is, man, he's really fundamentally sound. He really respects the game, you know? And I don't know if you can respect the game if you don't know details of the game you know what i'm saying like right. like we, we're talking about the the guys at the cool clinic which you're going to be a part of right and and 
listen to Jim McNally talk about offensive line play. Holy Christ. I mean, I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing. The detail and the coaching, the level of coaching. And, and it's not anything about a scheme. It's about how you, how you play the game at the highest level, right? Inside whatever scheme, if whether it's a Tony Franklin scheme or the, you know, the Miles Davis run and shoot, whatever it is, there's a way to play the game, right? That respects the game. And, yeah. and part of respect, respecting the game is, you know, it's, it's more than hustle and effort and all those other things. It's playing the game well. Yeah. And that's the, le- that's the unique thing that, that I got. So coach, you mentioned the details of the game and that respect for the game comes from understanding the details. And I see a lot of guys today. Um, and, and I think this is good. They understand the scheme. They understand the X's and O's in an incredible way because, you know, the, the internet is, has done a great job in teaching those things. The thing that I see maybe missing are those details. So that line is drawn this way, perhaps, but what happens on that line? There's an incredible list of details that happens on every single one of those lines. And when you look at the, the game today, uh, how, how do you think we can go about learning those things better? Because we used to do it. You and I were talking before, you know, you, you get together uh, the clinic after the clinic, right? And uh, you had all the clinic talk and then you get all the details over a few beers and you're, you're jotting things down on napkins and leaving with a stack of napkins. So uh, in today's virtual world, we don't have the virtual napkin, but how is that going to happen? How do we get all those details that we need to, to set our players up for success? Well, I think, you know, there's a couple things in that, Keith. Number one, like, like, get around. I think this is important. Like, I didn't, I, I, you know, people ask me about my career and they go, you know, I, I said, I never had a plan. I never had a, I mean, Mao Zedong had a five-year plan. I never had a plan for five weeks, right? And I mean, that's just the kind of guy I was. But luckily along the way, you kind of bump into or gravitate toward something. And I, I always loved being around great teachers, right? And so, and, and that maybe came from the fact that my dad, who had a lot of success as a baseball coach, was a, he, he was a, uh, his job throughout most of his professional career was he was an instructor for, of minor league players. So for example, with infielders, and if you were, I know when, just kind of give you an illustration. He's with the Cubs. They draft Sean Dunstan with the first pick in the first round. And Sean's a great athlete out of New York City that doesn't know if, you know, it's what, I mean, doesn't know very much, except he's really talented. So my dad's job was to go and work with Sean Dunstan every single day to help him become a better shortstop and how to field and fundamentals because he had no fundamental base. Well, as I watched his passion teaching, it, it really affected me. And then I go and I, and I, meet coach for meal. And then I go and meet this guy. There used to be, there used to be this thing called offense defense camps. And this guy, Mike Meshkin had the, had all, it was like a bunch of young coaches got together and he'd have a sprinkling of really good veteran guys. Jim McNally was there. Tom Moore was there guys like that. And so I wasn't an offensive line coach, but I get close to McNally any chance I could because I just loved to hear him talk about offensive line play the passion that he talked about with the duck demeanor and you know six inch rising blow and I, I, standing in the hallway in the dorm one night when he's going through with uh, I think it was Bob Wiley as a matter of fact going through you know what what you do against the you know the, against the hand swipe technique and he's talking about Anthony Munoz and I'm, I'm honest to God I couldn't get enough of it and so then I meet this guy named Greg Newhouse and Greg was um, long, later became the head, uh, excuse me, the uh, defense coordinator of Wire. Why he was defense coordinator in New Mexico. He coached in the pros for a number of years. Was at Oregon State, all, all over the place. And he was a DB coach, and I was I was a DB as a player, and then so started my coaching career that way. And he was so freaking good at the fundamentals. And he used to say, "You know what your job is." And Greg was like out there, like way out there, right? And he, he would say, you know what your job is? And I said, no, Greg, what is it? He goes, to make, to, to make your players more efficient movers. Now that is like, and, and this is like back in the 80s, right? Late 80s. 
And I go, make them more efficient movers. He goes, yeah, learn the game, break the game down. I mean, that's the way he'd approach it. He goes, you, you, you have a responsibility to your players to learn the game. You know, you, you know what cover three is, but you got to help that kid move. You got to help that kid become a better player. How does he get from there to there? Where does he put his eyes? That's the way Greg talked. He was that rapid fire. And so, into, and I thought to myself, wow. And then I meet Frank Gans later on in my career. And it reaffirms everything I'd ever thought. Because here's a guy that talks about six inch rising blow, you know, uh, uh, inside gap and depth, vertical set, uh, you know, two step redirect. I mean, all he, Frank has the game like condensed into this, this language, like this incredible language, which is again, one of the things that I think great coaches have is I, I know, I know this for a fact, you can come to my special teams meeting and you could go to Tom Gahey's special teams meeting with the New York Giants. And if you don't know anything else, but you know, or you, a kid from the Giants could come to us and they know exactly what we're saying because it's the same language. It's the language that Frank taught us, right? And it's small. It's not soliloquies. It's not, it's very short, very concise, very descriptive terms, right? And so I almost had to learn how to speak in this business, right? Yeah. Because what most coaches are going to do is you're going to be, you're going to talk way too much and the athletes are going to stand there, especially on the field where it has to go fast. You have to be able to, you have to have a, like a thing. What is, get a, one word. If one word can do it, why say seven? Because he's going to tune you out at three, yeah. right? And so all of those things were parts of that whole growth process. And, um, you know, you're, 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 what you're doing with this thing is so cool to me. And, you know, I'm not, you know, blowing smoke up your ass. I'm just telling you the truth because you know how we talked about this a number of times. This is the, this is, this is where the game has to go. Right. This is where the game has got to go. And so what I did is I started thinking about Frank's deal. Right. And, and, and you know, Frank's passed away now. And, and I really wish he would have been around to experience what we were able to do is we boiled the game down, Keith, synthesized it, boiled it down. As to use a Vermeil term, we redefined and refined the game to now that we believe that there are about 12 what we call transferable skills that every single football player on the field needs to be able to master to play at the highest level. And we've done, I, I've spent so much time with it that when we go to training camp, for example, we'll have a drill that teaches a player to go from being a long stride athlete to a short stride athlete and gain control of his feet right? Which every player has to do. What the line offensive line coach gives you this one. What, what are you talking about? My guys don't do that. I said, oh, is that right? Let's put on some tape, right? I said, okay, now let's put, give me, show me your screen game. Show me your pulls, right? Right. And all of a sudden there's that big six, six guy out in space with a better athlete and he can't make a play because his body is not in a position to make a play because he's never been really coached what to do and how to do when he gets to that point, right? The same thing, a receiver, I say this in training camp and the kids, the kids think I'm completely out of my mind, right? And they're probably right. But I'm, what I, to try and illustrate a point to the receivers, I say, guys, when we go to special teams, period, we're going to do what we call county fair, which is a station of fundamentals, right? And receivers, you're gonna be in it. And you may never play it down on special teams, but I guarantee you this, I've been in pro football 33 years and every single year, and we've had five Heisman tro Trophy winning quarterbacks, five of them that I've had an opportunity to be around. And you know what? Every single one of them threw an interception. And what happens if he throws an interception and you've got to make a tackle and it's the tackle that could send us into the championship game or win a championship for us. And you get in that moment and you don't know what to do. That's on me. That's on me. And it ain't going to, not on my watch. It ain't happening. Right now you can bitch about it all you want, but you're going to learn to tackle. You're going to learn what, and, and invariably. And so what do we do? Go back to what coach for me taught always confirm with validity everything you teach 
because kids today, are, you know, this is a this is a debate, and I'd really love to get into you get into this with you, right? People say, have kids changed? Mm, I don't believe that. I think the way kids are raised has been has changed, so that they come to us differently than 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 I came to Jack McNell, right? I came to Jack McNell as a kid that would do whatever I was told because that's what you did, right? In in your life, much less with coaches. Well, that not not a lot of that anymore. So now you got to be able to you have, you got to be able to explain to him why you're asking him to do this thing and how it's going to help him. Great lesson, great lesson I got when I first went to pro football. And I'm coaching Keith. I'm coaching guys older than me. And so I'm walking out to the first day of practice and the old defensive coordinator, older guy came up to me and he goes, how are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm good. You know, I'm, just, I'm bullshit and I'm, I'm good. I'm good. He goes, you nervous? And I said, yeah, kind of. And he, and he put his arm out around me and he said, listen, let me just tell you this. Don't ever try and bullshit him and, and tell him it, if you don't know the answer, you'll get them the answer, right? And as long as they feel that you're genuine and wanting to help them stay in the league and get another contract and have success, they'll listen to you. Don't worry about what age you are or anything else, which, you know, I see that, I see that happen so many times now with young coaches that come to pro football for the first time. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have a pro background, they think they got to put on some sort of show to, and, and the players see through that in two seconds, in two yeah. seconds. Yeah. So when, when you talk about confirm with validity, everything you teach, when we put up a skill, like uh, let's say our, we're, we're going through those transferable skills. I put them up on a board and I show the drills that we use to, to, and why we use the drill, not just, okay, guys, we're doing Seattle tackle tomorrow, which is one of those drills, but, where, why we do it, what, what the position you need to be in to do it well is exact, exactly what has to happen. And then I take one or two clips of game film and I show the thing being executed in a game. Now, because we're always selling, we're trying to, we're always selling, right? And if you confirm with validity what you teach, then you build trust. And when they trust you, then you got it. You got a chance. Yeah. If they don't trust you, you don't got a chance. No. So, you know, that kind of stuff, I think is the real, that's the roots of it. Thank you again for listening to the coaching coordinator podcast. Please. If you are enjoying the podcast, head over to iTunes or Spotify and click five star for rate. If you have a minute, write a review. It really helps the podcast. Check out our new home for the coaching coordinator podcast. That's at coach and coordinator.com and follow me on Twitter at coach. Hey, Grabowski.